Yep, it's your friendly neighborhood, Kev Lawrence, right here for 100 Proof on the show, on the program. We've got a special guest with us right here, the gentleman named Rafiq. Rafiq. How are you? Okay, bro. All right, Kev. What's All up? right. So we're going to do this right <laughs> and okay. everything. Let, let people, people know a little bit where, about you and where you're from. Okay. Uh, I was born and raised in the Bronx. I grew up actually a few blocks away from here in the Bronx, New York, you know, around, you know, Boston Road. All right. Uh, Gun Hill Road, all okay. that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just nice to be back here. I moved out of here, you know, I'm, you know, we moved out and so on. I covered a few boroughs, you know, Queens, Brooklyn, oh, you man, know, Manhattan. Sorry to hear that, sorry to hear that. Ha, 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 ha. Shout yeah. out to our Queens and Brooklyn people yeah. all over New York. But now I'm out there in BK. I've been, at, uh, I've been out in Brooklyn for, I guess, about maybe 30-something, 40 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. About 30 years. About close to 30 years I've been out there a little bit. And, um, you know, um, while out there, you know, and, and do other experiences in my life, I had become familiar with uh, things like the Burning Spear, there was an organization called the African People's Social Party that I had become familiar with primarily through the campaign to free Desi Woods. I was on the radio one night and they, I had caught that on the radio and I heard how they was doing it and it really intrigued me. They said free Desi Woods, what is that? Well, the campaign to free Desi Woods. Desi Woods was a woman who was um, a, a white man had attempted to rape her and, and, and a friend of hers. Uh, and, and they fought him, and, 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 and he ended up killed. They, 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 they knocked him off. They killed him because, you know, they had defended themselves, and they got arrested for, for the homicide of this and for this, for this white dude for defending wow. themselves. So then, you know, the organization, the, the African People's Social Party, got involved, and um, they had struggled alongside of Desi Woods and through uh, 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 exposing the government and, the, and the, you know, the... Uh, the, the, the um, the railroad tactics that they had applied to, you know, lock up and the lies and this and that, so and so on. They got her out. What was this? That was in, um, I guess that was about maybe 1976 or something like that. It was about 1976. Maybe, yeah, it was about 1976. Is that also during the time of, I believe that's during the time of Sonny Carlson and Black Watch? I think it was heavy out there in Brooklyn. Yeah, they were. There was, was actually doing, a movie, I believe, of the miseducation the yeah, the, of Sunday. The Carson. education of Sunday Carson. Me, the education. I'm thinking yeah. Hill, I apologize. Yeah. Education of Sunday Carson, which also I believe his his children or his son was the uh, X Clan. Yeah, I believe so. One of his sons was in the X Clan, that rap group. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This part of they called Black Watch, and I think a lot of people even had no idea about it, but they were in the neighborhood, watching over the people of the neighborhood. Yeah. The 70s and 80s was very, uh, it, the, it the, was some hard times. Yeah, the 70s and 80s. but primarily, I think that more so, it didn't have as much to do with uh, policing over the, the community for the people that lived out there. It was to monitor, to, to, to really, to, um, uh, 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 to, to expose the cops in the sense that the cops were so corrupt and so vicious that they wanted, we, you know, they have different ways in which we try to eliminate the state from our lives. You know, like the state apparatus is basically like a, a coercive, uh, a, a repressive uh, organization. That's what it is. And the police are probably like primary or they're, they're, they're up here when it comes to that, that particular thing, like that particular um, aspect of the state. You know, they're like a, a foreign occupying office, a, 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 a foreign occupying force in our community. So we do what we can to try to eliminate the state from our lives and to gain self-determination gradually. You know what I mean? That was the main, you know, more so than, you know, we had to have extra people out there to monitor over people knocking old ladies upside the head. It was more to eliminate the police, the, 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 the need for the police. To, we can intervene and solve our own problems without the use of the, the, the repressive and the coercive uh, state, you know, the state apparatus. Now, speaking of that, are we saying, are we going with majority of people? All the people or some people in law enforcement are the ones that at that time you felt like you had to eliminate them from being from occupying the neighborhood well um i think that what we have to understand that's is a big, that's a big question yeah. a lot of people say you know not yeah. all the police are yeah because i my father was a police officer and my father was cool with me he was a great father to me and my sister 
but I don't know how he was on the street. I don't know how he was on the street. I don't know how, I don't know if he was one of the dudes that bust people upside the head, you know, or like, I don't know what he was on when he, you know, when he was working. So what I'm saying is the police themselves, I got rel you know, relatives that, you know, police officers too and so on. And the, as an as a organization, they, they perform a particular role. Their role is to keep us repressed. It's not to protect and serve the people in the community. It's to, to protect the, the property of the- of That's the, how it started off, right? Protecting property. The, no, the police, I mean, the police started off as, as like slave patrols. They started out, they, originally, historically, they started out as, as slave patrols. And that was for the purposes of making sure that the, the slaves didn't try to escape and to make sure that, you know, everybody stayed in their place. Because their attitude was, unless black people are scared, then white people have, they, they, as long as black people are scared, then white people, don't, they have less to worry about. You know what I mean, in terms of maintaining this system of, of racism, white supremacy. I don't even like to use the term white supremacy because you, you, you're not really supreme. You gotta do something to be supreme, you know what I mean? You, you, just being brutal and, and vicious and, 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 and sadistic and so on doesn't make you supreme. But anyway, um, that's what the situation was. You know, the, 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 the state patrols, you know, uh, morphed themselves into the police uh, department. That was also with uh, Riker. The guy that they named Rikers Island. Yeah, he was a part of the New York Kidnapping Club, I believe. I believe I heard the, some of the information on that. A part of the New York Kidnapping Club, and he, he would hold you in an area, which actually got where the term or the name Rikers Island came mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a lot that goes with that. A lot yeah. goes with that. Now, with having you here, I like to give a big shout out to. Uh, Darlene, I don't say the whole name, but shout uh -huh. out to Darlene uh, for, the, for the link, the alley-oop, we could say. Uh -huh. uh, uh, we were supposed to talk to you earlier off camera about gentrification. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing going on. And people hear the term gentrification, and, but you don't understand tactics behind it. And I want to say off top, I'm never opposed to anybody moving anywhere as long as people that are living there don't get uh, displaced displaced, or their rent compared to their way of living or their the money they was making gets just another level of ridiculousness. Uh -huh. That's a real rock you use, ridiculousness. So I know that you're very, uh, you understand that, the tactics. So please talk to us about gentrification and even later on eminent domain in neighborhoods. Uh -huh or low-income neighborhoods. Okay, like, uh, we could start in the Bronx or in Brooklyn, it's up to you. Let's start in the Bronx, because, in the Bronx, New York, because I heard about a place in the Bronx, New York, called the Soundview section, mm -hmm. where they had the biggest drug raid in, I think, New York history, or even American I think history. It's America. American yeah. history, yeah. which was over 160 people. Yeah, there was, they had, a, I had 720 Law enforcement uh, personnel, FBI, ICE, Homeland Security, police, um, all of the different uh, different units of law enforcement. Wow. They all collaborated, and they did like a pre-dawn raid on on these housing projects right up here. That's not now, the first time. Now hold on, now I say this to people to understand, not to cut you off. My apologies. When I see some people doing things on social media. And I, I, some people I know, I talk to them, I tell them like, hey, listen, calm down with some things you're doing on camera or even on music. Because in reality, some people that do that on music are assigned to a label and they're allowed to get away with some things. While you're not signed to a corporation, so, uh, what you do or what you say on social media can affect you in ways you do not know of. People think like, you know, you if, I'm in a, if I'm in a project or whatever, mm -hmm. I say something, okay, I, they come see me, I do a quick bid and I come home and that's it. No, that's not it. And that's not necessarily be the project either, but no, that's not it. There's, it gets real deeper yeah. than that. Yeah. 
So can you please explain how deeper it gets, had, especially um, do something with NYCHA, which is New York City Housing Authority. Yeah, I had met a, a, a sister recently who basically, you know, allowed, you know, informed me about this, and basically, is, like you said, she was like the one that threw the alley oop. And um, in her situation, uh, was it East Chester Houses, right over here? They had 700, 750 different law enforcement officers. They came out of there with about 120 people, and they got them all under RICO. Racketeering Influence Corruption Organization Act, and they use it. Say that one more time, RICO, because people hear that term RICO, but they don't really know what it is. They think, is that a guy? RICO, no, RICO is, is, uh, is an acronym, and it's something that was started uh, with the gangsters, the, 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 the gangsters. I think that, I don't, it was, it was probably before Giuliani, but when he was coming through on like, um, the, the gangsters around like uh, Castellano and, 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 and Gotti and those the people, mafia. you know, Italian they came mafia, up with a thing Sicilians. that would like basically like encompass like this thing where it would make it easier for them to like get, pro you know, to prosecute them and so on and so forth. So it's called the Racketeering Influenced Corruption Organization Act, RICO Act. Make sure you hear that. And um, they use that to go into the projects. First of all, they, they undermine people's uh, ability to 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 work they don't have sufficient uh, uh, um, uh, you know they under they undereducate people in the, in, in, in the uh, 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 black and, and Latino communities and so that they can't really compete with other people for jobs like white people and so on and so forth and then they uh, they grow up and then they find themselves unable to really get the kinds of jobs that really provide them with a livable wage and this and that and so on and so forth and um, they just um, you know, find themselves in situations where they have to do what they have to do in order to sustain themselves. Right. And, um, you know, um, sometimes, like, certain people, you know, resort to, uh, like, different kinds of things, like, you know, selling drugs or whatever the case may be, other things that, you know, uh, characterize as crime when it's black people doing it. Now, when John DeLorean got busted with a whole suitcase full of cocaine in a, in a hotel. With, John DeLorean, who was this? He was the guy who had that car company the, at the, 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 the doors, doors opened up like open wings. Up. The DeLorean. Yeah, yeah, he got busted on camera in a hotel suitcase. Looked like he was, looked like, you know, you know, you know, like them suitcases we used to, um, parents used to send us down south for the yeah. whole summer. You and, you and your brother, you yeah. and your sister, full of cocaine on camera. He got over on entrapment. He beat it on entrapment. But if wow. a brother in the hood that's trying to make a couple of dollars to feed his daughter uh, gets knocked with a jack, which is a vial, he gonna get a lot of time and so on and so forth. So anyway, was it, the, was it a five grams of crack get you five years? I think that might be old news. It might be more now. But powder uh, gets you less. Five hundred grams of powder. of powder could possibly get you five yeah, years. But. Because of who generally has those, like you know, white versus black and so on and so forth. But anyway, over here in the projects, right over here in in. in East Chester, in the Bronx, they came you know. in the Bronx. They came through, and they took 120 people out. So now, out of that 120 people, assuming that it's about 110 families, assuming that maybe a couple of people live in the same apartment and this and that, that's 110 people that have been evicted. Okay, now what do you? So you're saying that if somebody does a crime, and you live in New York City housing uh, projects. Mm -hmm. If somebody does a crime and they're on the same you household, the, if you live in the same household as them, the whole, the whole family has family to move. gets put out. All of them, grandmama, grandson, everybody in between. So you can go Dog. to another projects. Well, huh? You can go to. Can you go to another project no. building? No, you can't get housing in the projects. Maybe not in the country. Oh, wow. Maybe not in the country. I'm not sure about the country, but you may not be able to get it in the country, but you definitely can't get it in New York State. And I don't think that's going to be as easy as you just moving to Jersey and applying for the projects out there and then you just, your problem is solved. All right? Because what happens is a shortage of housing, of, of affordable housing, and it, that's one way in which they can uh, alleviate that, what they consider like a problem for them and, and you know, and, and, and get new people in and so on. Uh, but what happens is they did that, they got a lot of people, they got these people on all these charges. Like if, if me and you are talking like, cause we grew up together in the projects. Right. And you know, I see you, I give you dap, this and that, blah, blah, blah. I might've been selling a couple of little vials or whatever, but you work, you, you taking care of your family and this and that, you, you know, you're not going through that. 
Me that I'm not selling any drugs at all. Seeing, they got cameras all up, all over the place in the project. By them seeing me and you talking, they kick your door in too. And they trying to hem you up with the rest of us because of our association, on the, or strictly on the basis of our association. Conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. So what happens is 120, let's say 120, 110 families, that's just one project. Kings, uh, East, East Chester project, that's just one project. The they came through pre-dawn raid, Got, they did it in all through Brooklyn. They did it in Harlem. They did it like they probably did it, you know, in the various boroughs and so on and so forth. But not on the level of East Chester or I forgot the name of the two projects in Manhattan. They came out with 102 people in one pre-dawn raid. So wait a minute. So if you have, that's a couple of hundred families mm -hmm. that have to find somewhere else to go. Yeah, they can't get public housing anymore either, and they're poor. So, but. So you can't move into a, if you're poor, you can't move into a rich neighborhood because you got to be no. rich. So then where do you go? Well, I guess that's your problem. I guess you have to find some family member somewhere that is willing to take you with it. You might have to split up. If you're a family of maybe six or five that lived in a particular apartment in, in housing or whatever the case may be, you, if you go find a, fa a relative that's going to take all six of y'all, you good. But if not, you're going to have to split up. You know, and then what happens is, like, let's say, for example, they used to do that under different, um, uh, you know, uh, that's a form of gentrification. And they had gentrification uh, before it was called gentrification. They had a situation in, like, in the 40s in, I think it was Landing or Lansing, uh, Ohio. No, not Ohio. Um, Lansing, Michigan? Nah, um, Illinois. It's somewhere beginning with an L. It's either Lansing or Landing or somewhere in Illinois or something like that. And um, they would do like what was called like redlining, where they was like, you know, uh, beating people out of their houses and so on and so forth. They was, you know, do like, you know, trickery and so on and so forth. They was getting people out of their homes and so on and so forth that had bought homes. You know, this was around the time like, you know, after, um, you know, uh, people had come up from the South and they might have like got a job somewhere in a place that like might have a car manufacturer or something like that, you know, like places that, you know, mm -hmm. well, provided people with livable wage, they was able to get up off that dirt down south that they were so glad about, you know, because a lot of people, my people came over from the south, they didn't want to see no dirt. You know, right, they were just right. tired of having to pull p cotton off of, off, of, off of, you know, or, you know, pull tobacco, they was sick of that. For people yeah. who don't know, cotton picking, I actually did that before, and your hands could be cut because yeah. the seeds of cotton are razor sharp. Uh, uh. I, I found out about we that. We pulled tobacco today. with little kids down in North Carolina. You know what I mean? And it's, you know, you bent over like for hours of the day pulling something. You know, and it's, it's, it's you know, you're able to do it. But, you know, a lot of my people that growing up doing it and whatnot, you know, they, as soon as they could, they got, out of, they got out of down south. They got out of South Carolina. They got out of Maryland because they was tired of that, you know? Right. But, um, you know, going back, like, um, these people don't really have much of an opportunity now to, uh, to, to stay together. Like, the thing I was talking about with, land, with, with, um, with Illinois back in the days, what it would do, and I, I learned about it from this book called The Warmth of Other Sons. I can't remember the author's name, but the book is called The Warmth of Other Sons. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about how, what it, how it would, like, break up the, the community. How it would, like, the, you know, like, we're all a community now. We don't have the support system that we had before. So now, like in places like in, in East Chester Projects or in Bedford Stuyvesant, so and so with the gentrification and so Best on. Bedford Brooklyn. That's yeah, in Bedford Stuyvesant, uh, Brooklyn, New York. Um, you know, we don't have the support system we used to have. It, the culture is jammed up and everything. It's like it's done differently in Bedford Stuyvesant than it's being done like in East Chester. East Chester was done through raids. Uh, Bedford Stuyvesant is just being done through like, it's like a monopoly game where black people don't ever get the dice. You know, basically, like, it's primarily, like, these Jews who are uh, just, like, out there quarterbacking, and they're going around buying up property, or as much property as they possibly can and whatnot, and um, they're um, getting people, black people out, fixing it up, and then they have, I remember situations, I recall, I read situations in magazines where the, the, the developer had finished like projects like you know buildings and so on and so forth and the tenants that moved in were white and they would tell the landlord we paying twenty six hundred to three thousand dollars a month for rent we don't want no black people in this building straight up we feel that we have the right to determine that we have the right to tell you that and the landlord since they paying that 
three thousand or that twenty eight hundred or whatever the case may be per month, they do it to a, to a appease the, the 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 tenants that are there. And like you know, I know people that live a couple blocks from me that got put out of their buildings and sort of. Wow. Yeah, yeah, right, right. You know, like a couple blocks away from me, I help people move, and you know, it's, it's constant. I've helped people move that got gentrified out. You know, people that I see all the time, I told them they, they might have lived in, 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 in a certain area, like in Crown Heights or something. They got, they say, yeah, I got gentrified out of here. I'm in Brownsville now. And they're hoping it don't happen out there. But, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is that by us being colonized, we don't really have the, 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 um, the, the organizational capacity to really fight back against this. And, um, you know, that's what's going to prevent this from happening. You know, we have to develop the organizational capacity by, you know, for one, like the organization I'm a member of, the International People's Democratic Uhura Movement, you know, along with the African People's Socialist Party, we have to go out there and um, raise a level of political and social consciousness among the masses of the people and fight against this. Have them, you know, recognize that we have to solve our own problems. We all we have. We're all we have. We don't so, have no friends. So to get back to the families that have to move, the tactics, uh, those people will say, you know, well, if you wasn't selling drugs, you don't have to worry about anything. Is that 100% true? Or is it also some people that probably even work in law enforcement probably help to push things to get promotions? Yeah, well, you know, you have- And not all. Because I know people that it wasn't, even, it wasn't even drug dealing. I know like relatives of mine that got put out of uh, uh, public housing because of, of things that they were accused of and so on. And, um, you know, for the most part, you know, we're put in situations, honestly, where we have to um, engage in these, um, these underground economies. Because we have to, we have, we know, we, like, we have children, we, we develop families and so on and so forth, and we have to, we have to take care of ourselves and, and our families. And we're not really provided with livable wages in the, in, the, in, the, in the jobs and so on and so forth that, you know, um, these outside forces are willing to provide, you know what I mean? So, you know, um, you know, a lot of times people say, you know, we don't, we, don't, we don't have to sell drugs and so on and so forth. You know, um, we haven't really, with, at every turn, we're attacked. Because they say That's, it's a choice, just yeah. like slavery. You have, um, yeah, we have, like, people that come from other parts of the world, like, um, like uh, uh, Asia. They might get, uh, their government might work with this government to, to, to provide them with, 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 with loans and so on and so forth for them to open up places like um, nail salons and fish markets and fruit and vegetable stands, so on and so forth. You know, they came over here voluntarily and, and they were able to do that and so on. So we were dragged over here and we, we were, were um, oppressed for the duration of our historical interaction with white folks. So for the most part, we didn't have the same opportunities that these Asians and Indians and so on and so forth have, and they might have assistance through their governments and so on and so forth to, uh, uh, you know, open up these different businesses. People like in Yemen, a lot of people like that home, like, like the stores and the communities and so on, like little used to be bodegas, and now people from Yemen, mostly Yemen, and like you know they're at war. They they bomb in Yemen now, but there's still a situation where their governments and so on and so forth allow for them to. You know, uh, 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 now it's all about capitalism. And how do you feel about eminent domain? And what does that mean? Well, eminent domain is a thing that used to only be uh, allowed for the government. The government was able to, for example, like, like in North Carolina, they wanted to build a, a research triangle. And they was saying, okay, we want to know, we don't know if we want to build it here, we're going to build it over there. But if they wanted to build it wherever they want to build it, they was going to come to the people and say, if we do decide to build it here, you have to go. I think they did that also in L.A. near With Dodger Stadium, stadium yeah, yeah. and the highway that had to go over yeah. that. Yeah, they did Shout that Shout out to people out there in Los Angeles, California. When I was in, um, when I used to stay in Maryland, uh, down in a place called Calvert County, I had some relatives, you know, that's where my mother people are from, Calvert County, Maryland. They uh, had a beautiful uh, uh, African community down there. When I say African, I mean us. You know, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I don't really refer to us as being American because we've never really been accepted in America. We don't have the rights that white people and so on have, you know, and so on and so forth. And, you know, we've just been always treated like as a separate, like, you know, entity and so on and so forth that didn't really benefit from the, the rights. The government never protected our rights or whatever the case may be. But like, you know, African communities down there, and they were gonna build a highway 
through the black community just to like, okay, we might build up this little area along the, the, the eastern, like the, the, the sea coast, the eastern seaboard or whatever they call it like that. Then they was gonna just run people off their land, you know, just because they could. But now, and, and I don't remember what year it was, I believe it was probably in the late 90s or the early 2000s or so on, this corporation wanted to acquire some land, and the private corporation wanted to acquire some land in Connecticut. And they, you know, they wanted to get the land this and that, blah, blah, blah. And they won the case. Wait, so it's not government, it's a corporation. This was a private, this was a private corporation. They, they wow. went into, they wanted to, you know, remove people from their land for the purposes of building up, you know, something for their corporation, whatever the case may be. And they won the case in Connecticut. They won the case. So now what it did was wow. it set a precedent where corporations could now, um, impose eminent domain on, on, on different areas. And they're doing that now. Like, they're doing that now. Like, uh, like you have a situation like I read in the Village Voice a few years ago where they're going to make the people that have businesses on Jerome Avenue, like in the 170s, get out. All right, so people that don't know, Jerome Avenue is in the Bronx, New York, and it's predominantly, uh, people that work there are predominantly Dominican. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll out, if you want to get anything in your car fixed, in the Bronx, Port they, had, they know go to Jerome Avenue because yeah. they hop out a lot of hardworking people yeah. that are out there with signs will jump from your car to fix your car, mm -hmm. do fabulous work in your car. Shout out to my people's out there. And I, I think I heard about that before. Yeah, and they could take, like you could roll up with, a, with any kind of car. Any kind of car. And say, um, I need a so and so. And they'll tell you, oh yeah, go to. Um, uh, go three buildings down yeah, and yeah. go in there on, on that side and, and ask for so and so, and they'll and they'll have it. They they got anything you want. It's either Dominican or Puerto Rican, so and so, a little bit of both, and so and so. But they're gonna just undermine all of that that people just you know over years built, and they now rely upon that wow. to sustain themselves. So you know when people talk about oh y'all don't have to sell drugs, this that, so on, you got to do something in order to survive out here because this is a capitalist system, and everything costs a lot of money, rent and everything else, food. You know, all that, you know, so, you know. Yeah, people have to know the control. If you think that you're going to go out there, you're going to, uh, you sell a little bit of, I'm not saying you should, I'm going to sell a little bit of uh, marijuana, New York soon will be getting legal, legal marijuana. Yeah. So why yeah. should somebody buy from you and have to worry about the cops? You just go to a, a dispensary mm -hmm. and buy yeah. from there. So what is left for people to do if they feel like they can't get the big jobs or whatever, and I guess robbery. You know, they narrowed it down a lot. That's what it comes down to. Start busting it comes out head again. And this is why I tell our people: don't be happy about, you know, medical marijuana being legal in the New York. Don't be happy because what is left for me to do? Strong yeah. arm robbery, yeah, home invasion, another. And some people don't want to give up their stuff. Yeah. So what does that mean? More killings. And, uh, you know, there's so much more to, to talk with you. And uh, we're so appreciative to have you on the show, Why Don't You Proof. How can people be able to get in contact with you to learn more from you, to even buy the magazine or be in touch with the magazine? Because I hear they get like a year subscription, so. Yeah, um, well, they have different links the on there uh, that allow you to, um, you know, link on to the different Things and you can stay in contact. You know, you can, you can keep yourself abreast of the things that the organization is, is doing. And um, you know, they have the thing like every Sunday morning, O'Malley taught me uh, at eight o'clock. And then, or you could go on to www.uhurunews.com. Spell that out for people. www.uhurunews.com, or you can go into www. ASI, which stands for African Socialist International. It's www.asiuhuru.org or, you know, U-H-U-R-U, A-S-I-U-H-U-R-U.org. And, uh, you know, you could just, like, keep yourself abreast of what's going on, you know, with the organization. You know, the organization has been Thank around, you. the African People's Host Party has been around since 72. And it started in in 1991. And um, we making moves. You know, we struggling to um, uh, bring the revolution that had been that had begun. Basically, I, I, I would say the, the Black Panther Party's thing, because the revolution it jumped. It was it started off in 1619. You know, on the ship, 
you know, when they was dragging black folks over here and whatnot. It started then. But I'm talking about like, you know, the whole thing about the, the Black Panther Party and so on and so forth with the with the with the socialist movement and that we the, the chairman O'Malley I should tell her, he really he he broke it down to the bone gristle. I've never read anybody's work that um, made uh, socialism more relevant and more clear than O'Malley I should tell her. You know, he broke it down. He 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 laid it out, you know, and it's really I think it would be extremely important for most for, for all of our people to link on to the things that I had uh, mentioned to you and to check out his political theory, you know, and whatnot, and and, to, and also to become a part of this organization. Everybody like with the, like with MPDOM, everybody is a resource, you know. It's, everybody has a talent, a little something that they could do to contribute. I don't care if you didn't do good at nothing, too much of nothing in life. There's something that you can do to help. You go out there and bring this from there and get get the paper and bring the paper. You know, there's something that you can do. You know, well, everybody's a resource. So we're trying to get everybody to contribute something or as much as they possibly can, but at least something. And we can, you know, we can we gonna make this happen. And once again, so funny about Kevin Martin here at 100 Proof. We're out of here. Rafi. Okay, my brother. Thank you. Thank you. All right.